Tonight on Inquiry, eight days in July, the search for Andrew Warburton. Last summer, Andrew Warburton came to Nova Scotia on vacation. That vacation turned into a nightmare. On July 1st, Andrew walked into the woods. On July 8th, he was found dead from exposure. I'm Joan Melanson. People are still talking about the Warburton search, the biggest ground search in Canada's history. It brought out nearly 6,000 searchers, but it was unsuccessful. Andy was found, but he was found too late. Why did it take 6,000 people eight days and seven nights to find one nine-year-old boy? Tonight on Inquiry, we try and find out what went wrong. The two groups which are supposed to find missing people say the search was well managed, that nothing went wrong. The Emergency Measures Organization and the RCMP say the Warburton file is closed. But Andy's mother, Doreen Warburton, has a lot of questions. She wants a public inquiry. You could see they weren't trained to handle um, large scale of volunteers, and they, they definitely did make mistakes. The Warburtons live in Hamilton, Ontario. Doreen, her husband Tom, and their other son Gary are back home, where everything reminds them of Andy. His school just a few blocks away. Last spring, Andy finished grade three just up the street, the favorite corner store where Andy was a regular customer. Andy and Gary used to play road hockey out back behind their house. Most of this gear is Andy's. He got it for Christmas. And I'd just say, come on Andy, let's go and have a game. And he'd always demand to get gold. And I'd say, okay, I like being a shooter. And that some big kid he's going with the whole neighborhood and that. He was always the goal. He wanted to be goal. He hated school, and like most kids do, Andy was not for school, but uh, he was he was good when he was in school. And uh, his, his teachers liked Andy. He was a, a nice little boy. Uh, lazy at times, like most boys, but um, definitely just a normal, happy, a very happy child. You know, very, very appreciative. He, he, you got your Mother's Day cards and your Father's Day cards, and he always told you how much he loved you. And he never forgot to write that in a letter. He wrote that the last thing he wrote. And, uh, what was the last thing he wrote? He wrote, I love you with all my heart. He was pretty happy for what you kid. Um, never a down, very often, always, always on the go. Doreen and Tom used to take the boys everywhere with them. Last summer, they came to Nova Scotia, one of their favorite spots. Andy always liked coming here to stay with his Aunt Helen and the Bulger family. The Bulgers live here, at the end of Tucker Lake Road near Beaverbank, Nova Scotia. Andy had two special friends here, Natalie and Nicole Carr the twins who lived next door to the Bulgers. They were almost always together, especially Andy and Natalie. So what kinds of things did you do together? Um, go to the store, hold hands. Hold hands? Were you boyfriend and girlfriend? Don't really know. But you were good friends. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what did you like about him, about Andy? He's cute. What else did you like about him? Um, he was funny. Andy was supposed to meet the twins and go swimming at nearby Tucker Lake on July 1st, Canada Day. At the Bulgers, it was just another day. Everyone stuck pretty close to the house. Andy's aunt, Helen Bulger, remembers it well. Uh, Doreen and I and Tommy were out the wood pile. Tommy was chopping the wood, and Doreen and I were piling it for him, and, you know, helping him out. <laughs> and um, Andy come about 
and asked her if she could go swimming. I asked him who he was going with. He was going with Natalie and Nicole, two little girls he played with. And um, I asked where he was going. He was going to the lady's house. Tucker Lake Road, the bulgers, the cars where the twins live, and the house where Andy said he was going to swim at Tucker Lake. But first, Andy went next door to the cars to see if the twins were ready to go. This is their house. Viola Carr may have been the last person to see Andy alive. She's the twins' mother. On that day, I was sitting right here watching another world on television, and uh, Natalie and Andy come to the door and said, Natalie said, how many more minutes, Mommy, do I have before I can go swimming? She was in the veranda watching my two-year-old granddaughter. And I looked at the clock, which is sitting right there, and I said, Natalie, it's now 20 to 4. You have 20 minutes. And I said, then you can go swimming. Her and Andy turned around and walked out. A few minutes later, the commercial come on. I come here to the window and open the window. And both children come here to the window. So the last time Viola Carr saw Andy was about 4 o'clock on her back step. Just behind the car house, there's a path to Tucker Lake. Andy and the twins had been down this way before. Here and go. Had you shown him this path before? Yes. Yeah. Was he on it? Yeah. Did he go down to the lake on this path before? Yeah. But Andy didn't know it that well. The twins only showed it to him once. Andy may have decided not to wait for Natalie and head off down the path to the lake. There's a fork in the path. If Andy turned right, the path would have taken him to the lake. But there's a theory that he got confused, turned left instead, and wandered into the woods. About 4.30, Helen and Doreen came into the house to start dinner. And Gary came back from the lake. Aunt Helen comes out and says, uh, where's Andy? And I said, I didn't know. So she said to go check. And we were looking around everywhere. We came back and we said we couldn't find him. They checked the neighbors. They checked the path down to the lake, the lakeside. Then Helen called the RCMP. A police officer arrived at the house at 5.45. We explained to her what, uh, what happened, that we couldn't find him. We told him we thought he might, might have went back there where he was supposed to go swimming. Then the RCMP officer went outside. Hub McDonald had just come back from summer camp that day. He didn't know Andy well. He'd only met Andy once, and that was three years ago. Hub told the RCMP he had seen Andy earlier that day. Okay, I've seen Andy come down, right down here. He sat on this rock right here, took his sneakers off, walked across, sat over on the bank, put them back on, walked up the bank, hit it that way, calling for his brother Gary. What time of day was that? It's about 2 o'clock. Mistake number one. The RCMP officer may not have asked enough questions about where Andy was last seen and when. Beaverbank River is at the end of Tucker Lake Road. Hub says he saw Andy cross the river at 2 o'clock and go into the woods. Even though everyone thought Andy was on his way to Tucker Lake, and Viola Carr did see him near her place two hours later at 4 o'clock. But the confusion over time wasn't the only thing that didn't make sense to Helen Bulger. Doreen and I were both out there. He had to walk by us to cross it, and we had seen him head there. We would have certainly stopped him. And uh, he didn't like that river. He was scared of that river. Why was he scared of the river? Well, he had, uh, they had been down here three years ago, and he got covered with leeches. And then we had taken him, Doreen and I had taken him a couple of days before this to the river with the two twins, and uh, Andy wanted nothing to do with the river. Helen says she told this to the RCMP officer. She also says she told the constable that Andy was never very far away from the twins. But the RCMP didn't question the twins, or their mother, Viola Carr. They said Hub was their only eyewitness, so the search started in that direction. The RCMP is responsible for finding missing people, but they get help from a group which responds to things like plane crashes, natural disasters, and search and rescue. It's the Emergency Measures Organization, better known as the EMO. The EMO gets money from the province to organize search and rescue teams. There are 22 teams in Nova Scotia, they each get $800 a year. 
The RCMP called in the tracking dog while the EMO rounded up the local search team. At 6.30, the dog was in the woods. The dog and dog master went across the river, followed a path beside it, and then circled back through the woods. This could have been mistake number two. They never went out behind the car house towards Tucker Lake on that first night. The RCMP never told them to. At 7.30, Waverly Ground Search and Rescue arrived at the Bulgers. The bus would be their command center. All the searchers are volunteers. They don't get paid. They're trained, but they train themselves. That night, they had a hundred searchers in the woods. Most of them were sent off in the direction across the river. Ron Marlowe trains the searchers on the Waverly team. He's a volunteer like all the other team members. He's been involved in searches everywhere from California to Vietnam. What would a child do who was frightened and lost in the woods? Ch ch children cry when they're, when they're frightened and lost. Uh, they may run, okay, they may hide. Uh, they, may be, they may become uh, 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 non-responsive. What do you uh, mean? Uh, they may they may simply uh, uh, cover their face and 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 cease responding to 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 any uh, uh, stimulus. They they may not respond to 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 a well-known person calling their name. Uh, they may hide from everything. Okay, when you become when you become massively frightened, everything is frightening. You know, e even someone calling your name, even someone you know calling your name. So. It, being lost is an, is an irrational state. It's not knowing where you are. Marlowe says Andrew probably did most of his traveling the first few hours he was in the woods, a few hours ahead of the searchers. The first step in the search should have been to secure the area, form a human chain to stop Andy. Mistake number three, that wasn't done. But there's a way it could have been done. There are water boundaries on either side. Between them, a line of cleared trees, a survey line. But Ron Marlowe didn't know about the survey line until after the search was over. That survey line would have allowed us to, to uh, confine the search area the first night to about one square kilometer. Uh, and one square kilometer takes about 250 man hours to search, or that's 25 people working one day. Why wasn't it secured? It's not on any maps. There was inadequate uh, intelligence gathering on, on the part of, uh, of uh, uh, some of the field crews that were, that were uh, in that area. Andy probably crossed that survey line. Had it been secured, chances are he would have been picked up that night. Mistake number four. There's almost no training for people who direct the searches. Bernie Marshall was the director on the Warburton search. He knew about the survey line. He says he didn't secure it because that would waste time. Okay, and your list is outside the door. Pick up your list and give me your time out. Bernie Marshall wanted to keep his men moving. This was only his second search as director. He's never had any formal training. The Emergency Measures Organization has never provided it. And he spent that night in the woods. Two, Andy had not been seen in 15 hours. It would probably be eight or nine in the morning that uh, Doreen had uh, said they'll probably bring the military in. They'll bring the military in, won't they? They didn't bring the military in that day. That may have been mistake number five. By mid-afternoon, the rain started. It didn't let up. It brought out a lot of concerned volunteers, nearly 500 that day. But Doreen and Tom Warburton wanted the army. Started raining and the temperature started getting too low. That should have been time to bring in. You know, people who knew what they were up against and who were maybe perhaps trained better to um, find them. But uh, definitely, he got a long ways. You know, for a kid not knowing the bush and that that well, he did travel quite a ways. But if this all had in the first couple of days they had been there, I think the old come would have been a lot better. What do you think that would have been? 
Yeah. I think they would have found him alive. At the Bulgers, it was still a waiting game. That night, the temperature dropped to 12 degrees, and the rain kept up. Andy had not been seen for almost two days. Day three, the searchers were still working in ever-widening circles from the point where Andy had supposedly crossed Beaverbank River. But later that day, things changed. It was good news at the time. Sightings. Three separate accounts that Andy had been seen and heard. Everyone was moved to the area. There was a, a sighting of, by two boys. I think they were paper boys or up at Ch uh, what is known as the Chesapeake area. And, uh, of course, our, we were just flying then. We figured, well, they finally got them. And uh, the police come down and asked uh, Doreen to go out and cruise and call for them up, up that area. And uh, we did. We come home, we thought it was just going to be a matter of time, it's, you know, even the, the police were very hopeful, even then they were, you know, even happy, you know, figuring that this was going to do it, but no. Doreen went out and called for her son, but the sightings proved to be false. That's mistake number six. Even though the sightings were not 100% certain, all the searchers were pulled out and sent up to an area called Chesapeake Road. Lane McDonald was one of the search volunteers who was pulled out. All we done was sat and waited and hoped they were right. Uh, they weren't. And that was discouraging because we were in the woods. We should have continued with our, our search anyway. Uh, if they had found them, they could have contacted us. So it was a lot of wasted hours there getting into the point where we were and then back out again and we should have still been searching. What about those sightings? Do you think there was anything to those? Being in the woods, you know, for the seven days while Andy was missing, we, we seen a lot of things that could be mistaken for a little boy. One was uh, young deer, fawns. They were dancing around our feet everywhere up in there. And uh, you know, a quick glance, you know, with the same height as a little boy, same color. Uh, I think that's what people were saying. People were supposedly hearing him, too, hearing him calling or something. Well, again, that's the time of the year with the porcupines breed and that's exactly what they sound like a young kid screaming and uh, it could be misinterpreted for that very easy they searched through the night and all the next day in the chesapeake area by day five 14 organized ground search and rescue teams from across the province had come out to help find andy but the search teams are not coordinated. Each team uses different maps. They're on different radio frequencies. They use different markers, in some cases toilet paper, to show the areas that have or have not been searched. This lack of coordination among the teams is mistake number seven. We're not, we're not in any competition here. We want to save this kid. Each team has its own system. Each thinks theirs is best. Precious time was lost because the Emergency Measures Organization does not enforce standards for all teams to follow. During the search, the people kept coming. They turned up at the school to wait for instructions. But most of them had no training in search techniques. Mistake number eight. The search organizers were not prepared for this many untrained volunteers. Many of them never got into the woods at all. They spent their time waiting for someone to tell them what to do. On day seven, the military finally got into the woods. And on day eight, Andy was found. Dead from exposure. The coroner said he had probably been dead since day four or five. Andy had walked at least four kilometers. He was found north of Square Lake. But no one will ever know how he got there. Nothing was going to bring Andy back. We realize that, but maybe some of the searchers down there would like to know. If there's been boops made, then they got the right to know. Because it would help, too, in case of another kid ever, ever getting lost. Well, if there's been a mistake made, maybe it may help out the next child that may get lost, too. Ron Cole is the head of the Emergency Measures Organization in Nova Scotia. 
He says there were problems, but they didn't affect the outcome of the search. So what do you think of, of the search for, for Andrew Warburton? I think it was well conducted. There were problems. I'll admit that. The problems were generated by the number of, and I'll use the word volunteers, i.e. members not being members of search teams. One of the problems was the number that came in there. And they tried to use them, utilize them, and they were incapable of meeting them with the resources they had available to them. Is ground search and rescue a priority? All programs within the emergency measure organizations are priorities. Is ground search and rescue a priority? Yes, it is. Were you at EMO prepared for this search, for a search of this scope? Yes, I would say we were. Do you think that your people were trained as well as they should be to conduct a search successfully? Yes, I do. Do you think that there was um, uh, a lack of coordination between the teams in terms of the types of maps that they were using, for instance? Again, this is a judgmental thing. Uh, some teams use one map, other teams use another map. Teams may not have been familiar with the type of map that was being used there. Can't you see there a, a problem existing there? No. Mr. Cole, if everything was working so well, uh, why is it that um, after eight days and seven nights, a nine-year-old boy was found dead? Why is that? I know what you're looking for. No, I just, I, I would like to know after eight, after that length of time, what happened? Why wasn't he found alive? Why was he found dead after so much time and so many people? I don't feel I can comment on that. I believe that the RCMP should comment on that. There's been enough said about the subject, and I feel that that's where it should stay. But the RCMP won't talk about the Warburton investigation. They say the search is over, the case is closed. That's not an answer. As far as I'm concerned, that's just saying, okay, let's, let's forget about the whole thing. And we can't forget what we saw, and uh, we probably will never forget. But, like, we're not blaming volunteers. We're blaming uh, the AMO. You might as well say we're blaming them because... We feel that uh, there were mistakes made and we could all, all learn from it. Public inquiry into the search for Andy Warburton. Please write us and let us know what you think. We're at Inquiry, CBC Television, Box 3000, Halifax, Nova Scotia. Our postal code is B3J3E9. Or you can give us a call. Our phone number is 420-8311. Next